Hey everybody, and welcome to the 5 Bytes Podcast. I'm your host, Rory Monahan. The podcast, as always, is brought to you by my amazing sponsors, Goliath Technologies and Liquidware. And now for some news. ThreatPost.com have reported that with Windows 10 version 19.03, outdated or insecure wireless authentication standards such as WEP and TKIP will now be flagged as not secure. It's a good move for Microsoft in my opinion as both WEP and TKIP have known flaws that allow easy decryption for eavesdroppers or for those wishing to launch man in the middle and malware injection attacks. For the most part, this should be a non-issue for the majority of enterprise customers and even home customers or home users as WEP and TKIP are quite old and it's likely that most people will not be running that anymore. ZDNet have reported that Windows 10 version 1903, which if you're keeping count is the May update, has been failing to install on some machines with AMD RAID drivers installed. The particular machines that contain AMD Ryzen or Ryzen Threadripper processors stop the install if they have been configured in SATA or NVMe RAID mode. Microsoft and AMD recommend that users facing this problem download and install the latest version of the AMD RAID installer driver, which is version 9.2.0.105. Speaking of AMD, The Verge reports that AMD is set to release its 7NM Ryzen 3000 processors on July 7th with prices ranging from $199 to $499. The Ryzen 9 3900X would be AMD's first mainstream CPU to feature 12 cores. In total, AMD are releasing a range of 5 processors based on their new 7NM Zen 2 architecture which provides support for the new PCIe version 4 interface. If you're watching this week's episode on YouTube, you will see a handy chart provided by The Verge which shows the entire range of processors being released and for those not watching the video, you can see that the top of the range, the 3900X as mentioned, features 12 cores a base frequency of 3.8 GHz with boost to 4.6. The cheapest and lowest end of the range is the 3600 which features 6 cores, a base frequency of 3.6 GHz at a boost to 4.2. This week marked two weeks since the RDP wormhole was publicized. Malware Tech Blog on Twitter tweeted that it took him all of an hour to figure out how to exploit it using Python, which is pretty funny because I believe on the day it became publicized, he tweeted that he wasn't even going to bother trying because all the quote script keys were already all over it, so he was just going to leave it. Unfortunately, as Kevin Saverud tweeted out this week, Sophos customers running on Windows 7 or Server 2008 R2 who also run Windows Defender ATP on Windows 7 and Server 2008 R2 may see sporadic issues installing Windows updates. The behavior is that upon reboot, it gets stuck at configuring 30%. At this time, there is no fix and Sophos users should not patch if they are running that service. In the last update provided, Sophos stated that both Microsoft and Sophos have been working closely to identify and resolve the issue. Microsoft has provided the following information. Customers running Windows Defender ATP on Windows 7 or Server 2008 R2 may see sporadic issues installing Windows updates. Microsoft is aware of the issue and is rolling out a fix to Windows Defender ATP over the coming 36 hours. No customer action is required. The fix will be automatically applied by the Microsoft Monitoring Agent Service. And that was an update from the 24th, but I have not seen any further update within that stated 36 hours to suggest it has been fixed, which is pretty disappointing. It's also interesting, I haven't seen too much widespread information from others running the Defender ATP service. It only seems to be Sophos who are stating this, 
So I guess it's a conflict between the Microsoft service and their service. Hopefully a fix will be released soon. Microsoft have released the latest security baseline for Windows 10 and Server 1903. And what do you know? They have dropped the password expiration policy that requires periodic password changes. If you follow any tech news, Microsoft blogs, or this podcast, you know this has been planned for some time. They've stated the reasoning for removing the policy is periodic password expiration is an ancient and obsolete mitigation of very low value. And Microsoft don't believe it's worth while for their baseline to enforce any specific value. By removing it from the baseline rather than recommending a particular value or no expiration, organizations can choose whatever best suits their perceived needs without contradicting the Microsoft guidance. At the same time, Microsoft reiterates that they strongly recommend additional protections even though they cannot be expressed in their baselines, which is pretty interesting wording. It's kind of like a little bit of a get out clause in my opinion, but sure, whatever. The default administrator and built-in guest accounts will now also be disabled by default in Windows 10, among many other changes. For a full list, check it out for yourself. I'll provide a link on 5bytespodcast.com under reference links for episode 74. The hardware-based isolation technology on Windows 10 that allows Microsoft Edge to isolate browser-based attacks is now available as a browser extension for Google Chrome and Mozilla Firefox. The extensions for Chrome and Firefox automatically redirect untrusted navigations to Windows Defender Application Guard for Microsoft Edge. This is pretty cool. Some other vendors have been working on this type of isolated browser or secure browser for a while and redirecting to it. So it's cool to see that Microsoft's not keeping this one to themselves and they're adding this value to the other two largest mainstream browsers, Chrome and Firefox. So kudos, Microsoft. It has been pointed out by Jeremy Sinclair on Twitter that Google are explicitly filtering user agent strings on their YouTube site for anything containing the letters EDG, which of course pertains to Microsoft's Edge browser and the new Chromium-based Edge. You may recall that a few weeks ago on the podcast, I covered a story about Google's enterprise chat app not allowing the new Edge browser, and there was a statement that it wasn't an explicit block against Microsoft's new browser, rather they had an explicit allow requirement and it had not yet been allowed by Google. This case seems a little different as based on the video, which you'll see on the YouTube version of this episode, it looks like the site is specifically targeting Edge by the user string EDG. Others have made the point on Twitter that Edge is still in its pre-release form for the Chromium browser, and it could be a case of doing this until the browser has been officially released. But the fact it's explicitly targeted using the letters EDG, I can't help but feel it's a little trickery at play from Google, which is a real shame. There was a great article about how Microsoft and Google's engineers have been working pretty well together since Microsoft decided to embark on this Chromium-based edge. But I guess big tech companies going to be big tech companies at the end of the day. Earlier in the week, rumors started floating around that there was a Windows 10 Home Ultra Edition on the horizon due to a Dell press release creating some confusion. Microsoft have come out since then and have said that it's not true. This doesn't mean that there won't be some other flavor of Windows 10 Home in the future, but for now they have denied that an Ultra Edition is in the works. One of the most exciting tech companies in the world, in my opinion, Magic Leap, have announced they are to acquire a Belgian-based startup named Mimesys. M-I-M-E-S-Y-S. TechCrunch.com have reported that the Mimesys team have been working on bringing a Star Wars-esque volumetric video call product to the Magic Leap platform. And it appears with the acquisition that Magic Leap may have designs on creating their own built-in modern video chat experience. So very cool for all those Magic Leap enthusiasts and future potential enterprise customers 
as this type of video chat experience may ship with the product in future. TechCrunch.com also reported that Palo Alto Networks acquired a container security startup named Twistlock for $410 million. They also announced intention to buy a serverless security startup called PureSec. Unfortunately, at the time of this recording, Palo Alto Networks stock price dropped by over $5 on the news. So I guess investors do not like the news of these acquisitions. It's also interesting that in the last week, FireEye acquired Verodin for $250 million. Insight Partners acquired Recorded Future for $780 million. And together with these Palo Alto acquisitions, that means there has been about $1.5 billion spent on security-related acquisitions this week, which is pretty staggering. The Microsoft MSIX Toolkit has been released this week with a couple of scripts and an app installer file builder for your MSIX packages. For those in the Insider Preview for MSIX Packaging Tool, an update has been made available that now supports reboots during the package creation and the ability to assign a default cert for your packages so you don't have to do it each time. There are also several other fixes listed. For full information, I'll share that link under reference links for episode 74, again on 5bytespodcast.com. Matthias Slim noticed a pretty interesting installation issue with the Citrix VDA for server and workstation. The optional optimize performance feature, which can be enabled with the slash optimize switch, does not work as expected on version 717 and up. He recommends instead to use the standalone Citrix Optimizer tool, or of course, you could use the awesome BISF tool, or hell, you could use Citrix Optimizer and the tool. Why not? According to NetworkWorld.com, NVIDIA is launching its own edge computing platform for artificial intelligence processing. It's called the EGX platform. The move makes a lot of sense given the uses for NVIDIA's GPU today. They will empower customers to put AI computing closer to where sensors collect data before it's sent to larger data centers. EGX uses NVIDIA's low-power Jetson Nano processor, but also all the way up to the NVIDIA T4 processors that could deliver more than 10,000 trillion operations per second, which is great for real-time speech recognition and other real-time AI tasks. So you could imagine how that would be very beneficial out on an edge network. The article goes on to explain that EGX comes from 14 server vendors in a range of form factors combining AI with network, security, and storage from Mellanox, which was an acquisition last year, I believe. The racks will fit in any industry standard rack, so they will fit into edge containers from the likes of Vapor.io and Schneider Electric. Edge stack is optimized for software that includes NVIDIA drivers, a CUDA Kubernetes plugin, a CUDA container runtime, CUDA X libraries, and containerized AI frameworks and applications, including TensorRT, TensorRT Inference Server, and DeepStream. The platform already has some pretty large early adopters like BMW, and it's already running enterprise-grade Kubernetes container platforms like Red Hat OpenShift. And now this week, there's a hot job. This episode's hot job is from ITQ Leuven. If you're an experienced champion of VMware end-user computing technologies and able to quickly adopt new material and technology, if you have an ability to identify customers' use cases and translate them into solutions based on rapidly developing innovation of the virtual workspace, this could be a great role for you. The successful candidate should have a college or university level of functioning, several years of IT experience in a range of industries, good social and communication skills, plus excellent Dutch and English speaking and writing skills, which is where I fall down. (laughs) My English is barely passable and my Dutch is non-existent. Some of the skills should include familiarity with and interest in the VMware portfolio, which is kind of a given based on the description, a profound knowledge of one or more VMware EUC products like Horizon, App Volumes, User Environment Manager, AirWatch slash Unified Endpoint Management, or VMware Workspace ONE. 
some of those are newer than others. You might have Horizon and App Volumes, for example. They've been the VMware UC stack for a few years now. You should have thorough knowledge of one or more VMware SDDC product, like vSphere, vSAN, vRealize operations. Thorough knowledge of Microsoft Windows platform. Thorough knowledge of one or more application distribution products, like App Volumes, ThinApp, AppV, or maybe something else. And current VMware certifications, which is also where I'd fall down because I'm not very up on certs. I kind of gave up on that. If you're interested in this position, I will share a link with this episode under hot job on 5bytespodcast.com with episode 74 in the reference links. And now, the weekly webinar. I've been out of consulting for about three years now. I didn't know there was such a thing as an experience level agreement, or XLA for short. I guess some service providers are now selling this form of an agreement, which is based on productivity impact and end user experience scoring, which is pretty interesting. This week's webinar discusses this and how to measure and ensure a consistently great end user experience using Lakeside SysTrack, which by the way is an awesome product. I have used it on multiple migration projects and some VDI projects. It's a tool that I've actually blogged about, I believe, a couple times, and I even demoed it at a conference in Oslo a few years ago. The tool really is the perfect discovery tool for these kinds of environments, as it comes with pre-built templates for displaying the data pertinent for things like VDI, Windows desktop migrations, SCCM migrations, and more. Interestingly, I also saw that Lakeside SysTrack have a partnership with iGel, and it seems a lightweight version of their product ships with some of the iGel Thin clients now, at least in the demo that I was provided on my UD Pocket device, so that was pretty cool. This webinar actually took place today, or rather the day that I'm recording this audio, but it is available right now via the recording, so check that out. If you've never heard of SysTrack, you definitely need to check the product out. It's pretty insane. And now this episode's scripts, tricks, and tips. Ask me for tech.com with the number four, not F O R, in that URL. Posted a great series on how to use PowerShell to scan IP address ranges to gather all kinds of great details in, like host names, operating systems, CPU, memory, disk space, and more. It's pretty interesting because there's a lot of enterprise companies who are paying for third party products to do just this. So if you do not have a budget and you want to roll your own, This could be perfect for you. Also a bonus tip this week, Anoop C. Nair released a video series on how to set up third-party software updates through SCCM. The third-party patching has been a pretty big topic for many years and was an obvious hole in the older SCCM products. And a lot of people had to rely on a third-party product to integrate with SCCM to achieve patching of some of these third-party products. If that describes you, you'll definitely want to check this video series out to see how you can maybe wean yourself off of a paid product for doing this, or even just to learn how a noob achieves it himself. And that's it for another week. As always, thank you so much for listening.